writing novels. <laughs> I started writing novels first, like the last 50 years, and I transitioned to films because we can have hundreds of millions of viewers with a film. And, you know, what we've normally done, the films is open in major cities, New York, and then I go to the opening night, and then we go to Washington, Philadelphia, LA, Seattle, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, now we can't do that, but still uh, digitally, we have, a, you know, a, a big reach. And I think this Mongolian film uh, is going to, I'm hoping, will get the same kind of reach and put the spotlight on Mongolia and probably destroy the culture. So, <laughs> you know, I'm, I always worry about that a little bit, that, you know, you're going to get, once things open up, and I'm sure they will open up after this pandemic, that you're going to get a lot of tourism. Um, the film, I think, and you're going to start commenting on the film, but from what I gather, we've got, the, we did a, we're doing a sneak preview, which you've looked at, and people are just saying it's visually, you know, amazing, and the music is good, and blah, blah, blah. Anyhow, um, yeah, you should say, why Southeast Asia? Why Mongolia? You know, why not? Is it my, I, I'm drawn to places you're not supposed to go to, like in Burma when I filmed, they call it Myanmar, but Aung San Suu Kyi, who was famous, but now is in disrepute. Uh, I, you couldn't go into Burma and you were not allowed to film. And they, told, they warned me, don't film, but I filmed. I got in trouble a couple of times and just sort of weaseled out. Uh, I, I've always been a bad boy. I was in trouble all my elementary school days and I'm still in trouble. And people ask when I'm gonna grow up and I don't know, I'm working on trying to mature. So that was Burma. Uh, Angkor Awakens is a special interest to me in a kind of way, it was an auto, what do you wanna call it? Auto Holocaust basically is where people uh, I'm a child of the Holocaust. I speak German, as you just discovered. Uh, my parents are from Vienna. Most of the family didn't get out, but 1938, they got out. I did a film, Last Stop, Kew Gardens, about growing up in Queens, New York, where all the kids spoke German, or at least a lot of them did. And so that was Last Stop, Kew Gardens. I've done, my first film was 1985, during Ethiopian famine for uh, PBS. And I did a comedy called Green Lights. I mean, uh, there's nothing I won't try at least once. And I'm very interested in places that are remote and accessible. I, I don't want to use the word exotic, right? It, it, it used to have a good connotation and now, you're right? It, exotism is, but it is, Mongolia is exotic. I'm sorry, forgive me. Uh, it is like no other place. Well, actually Burma is like no other place, but Mongolia also. Uh, it's not Chinese. Uh, as people are beginning to discover, uh, they don't, Mongolians don't think of themselves as Asian. Uh, the language certainly is not, you know, an Asian language, and, but you know all this. So anyhow, um, I have a very, and I'm gonna end this, I don't wanna hog the whole period. Um, I, I used to use crews, BBC crews in England, wherever I was filming. And in Burma, you were not allowed to have you know, not a lot of film, much less have a crew. And so I began filming myself. I'm a good photographer, I think, still photography. And so I, I found that it was very effective that I could have these intimate discussions. And if you see Encore Awakens, for instance, you'll see people really open up. Uh, that it's just me, the camera, and I'm doing sound. I'm doing, you know, imagery. I use available light wherever, ever possible. So I'm always in a place that hopefully is quiet where I've got light coming in from a couple different angles. And uh, you get people to open up. Now, Mongolians are not, right, you can correct me, an effusive bunch, right? They are low key, they're shy, but I think, and you're gonna have to comment on this, I, I got them talking. I even got them crying, but I didn't include that in the uh, in the movie. We just didn't figure in. So anyhow, uh, that's the means in which I've been working. And then, of course, we have drone shots that I didn't do. And I want to take full credit for this film and all the laurels and applause. But the truth is, uh, there's a big team working behind me, and without them, I couldn't have done this. Um, you know, Deborah Horde, who's uh, my co-producer, and also 
did the first pass of the editing. And then David Cossack is a file editor. We have, you know, sound people, animation, you know, drawer artists. And so this was a rather expensive film. I still wonder if we'll ever see enough money back. To, and we got to raise, about in my pitch, we have to raise money for outreach. The outreach is incredibly important. So once we have the big release, you know, the international release, we, we, we got to get the word out. Uh, Jack, I, I have a feeling you know Jack Weatherford, uh, <laughs> right? Uh, Jack, uh, you know, his, pu his publishers will probably jump on board, but we need to hire publicists and we need to get reviews like usual, New York Times, L you know, LA Times, Washington Post, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the, it's very important to get reviews. This is a whole brave new world. And the question is, you know, I noticed the Times and the New Yorker are doing reviews for streaming. It seems to be where it's going. And so I'm caught in a kind of quandary. Do, do we sit on a film till the spring, you know, when things open up, go, go theatrical again? Uh, or do we, you know, go with it, you know, in, in the near future? So, you know, I've been talking to various distributors and we're running a sneak preview now, as you obviously, I think you've seen, has everybody seen it? Um, it's good. They extended for another week. We have 4,000 hits on the trailer. And if you look geographically, and we can, it's everywhere. Even Vanuatu, wherever that is in the South Pacific, there were two people, two views. <laughs> but, you know, lots of views. Germany, you know, England, France, you name it. It's South Africa. So this is very surprising to me. Honestly, I thought Mongolia would be a niche film. I didn't think there would be this kind of interest and maybe you can explain why. I don't have a clue. Uh, I do like Mongolia because I live in a country in 120 acres and they had even more acreage. Uh, so uh, that's the wonder of Mongolia. And the film deals with the good, the bad. You know, we tried to do a balanced view. We didn't touch politics for a, a specific reason. And that is, we don't want a film that's going to be dated. And in Mongolia, right, the elections come and go. By the way, Ayun Gurel, Ayun Gurel is in the movie. You know who that is, right? Hey, she's running for the chairmanship of the Democratic Party did yes. just these days. <laughs> yes, she was on a, a Zoom we had with the theater. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, she's an up and comer. If she hasn't arrived already, she's going to go, we suspect, higher. Anyhow. So that's about it from here from Lake Wobegon. Uh, Fantastic. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, that gives us a great sense um, and, and nice to, to learn about that background. Oh, can I add one thing? One important thing. You're academics primarily. Is, is that a good guess? We can make available for academic screenings, you know, a separate thing which will not interfere with any of the sneak previews or anything else. So if you want an academic screening, uh, contact us. I don't know if you can do it in person, but we can give licenses out where the students can come in from, you know, everywhere and watch. And we can, and if you want information, I can get that to you from Deborah or whatever. We'll, we'll figure it out. I just thought I'd mention academic screen. Oh, fantastic! That's actually a very nice opportunity because it's. Uh, I mean, whether we're on Zoom or not, adding different kinds of content is something that we're all doing in our classes, right? Yeah, and the um, other films are available. Yeah. Morris, so um, as I mentioned, uh, one of your fortes and, and one of your footprints in scholarship is, is sort of the, the 20th century and Mongolia in it. The film um, has sort of an introduction and then has a long middle piece that does the historical sweep before it gets sort of the contemporary. Um, what, what, what do you think? What did you see? What did you hear? Uh, where are the emphases? Uh, there's probably some places you disagree. There's probably some, some places you thought the portrayal was, was very successful or, or eff effective. Well, um, I particularly uh, like the modern part uh, of the film because I think it dispelled some of the images uh, about Mongols, uh, that Mongols somehow are all out in the steppe lands as nomadic pastoralists. And uh, as, as uh, the film points out, uh, uh, half the population now lives in in a city, and I thought the uh, the description of air pollution, the problems that have resulted from uh, 
this mass exodus from the countryside, the pollution, the, uh, the problems of 60% of the population living in these gear quarters where uh, no running water, as you very beautifully showed, uh, Mr. Liebman, and uh, other facilities being um, not particularly uh, read, uh, readily available. I thought that was the most successful by far uh, of the film, and I enjoyed that very much because it's not shown very often. You, you can see pictures of the steppe lands in, in other films, uh, and you can see uh, pictures of uh, Genghis Khan and so on, but uh, contemporary Mongolia uh, is uh, sort of overlooked, and I thought that, that clearly came across in, in your film. Uh, uh, I, I think the the uh, problems of contemporary society were really vividly portrayed. Um, I wish you'd have gone more into the problems of mining, but that would have added to a lot of, a lot of other uh, difficulties. But what you did was great. And um, in terms of history, I had some problems with it, but uh, it's inessential uh, to, to my mind. Um, I'm not a great fan of Jack Weatherford, and uh, so, uh, uh, you know, he's uh, comes up with all sorts of, he, he's not a scholar for, for this era. He doesn't know the languages. Uh, he, uh, to my mind, uh, makes quantum leaps forward about Genghis Khan being a Democrat, uh, about Genghis Khan international law. Uh, Yasakh was not international law. It was a, a law that was imposed by the Mongols, not by anybody else. So uh, that uh, did not was not uh, something I, I found uh, of great interest. Um, and, but the, the modern stuff was terrific. Thank you, um, Orhan. Uh, political geography it shows up i mean certainly we see landscapes and we see sort of wide geography we see we hear about care districts and sort of the the geography of of the urban development what else did you see in the film um first of all uh, i would like to thank you for putting the, together this panel like morris i did enjoy watching the film and the cin cinematography was remarkable it's beautiful but again, coming from my political geography background, especially political geography background, I have some um, points, I guess I wanted to uh, come across. So the first of all, well, actually it, it's, uh, thank you for uh, mentioning my book uh, that came out a couple of weeks ago. Actually, I haven't ha uh, received an actual physical copy yet, <laughs> but it really is in conversation with my book. The whole uh, main thesis of the book is on this deconstructing the idea of the Mongolia is this land of nomads, an idea uh, that's both perpetuated by what I call spectators of Mongolia, that's visitors to Mongolia, scholars of Mongolia, and anyone who is interested in Mongolia have this perception of Mongolia as the land of nomads. I think the film falls in that category. And also I look at the self-objectifying trope Mongolians use to perpetuate this idea uh, that Mongolia is land of nomads. So in my book, I try to create, give this more nuanced version of Mongolia, which is to say that even if we call herders Mongolians, it oversimplified this incredibly complex, diverse human terrain that we, Mongolia, uh, we have in Mongolia. So having said that, I thought the film, like uh, Morris, I did appreciate different uh, landscapes, both historic and contemporary scenes, but I couldn't help wonder uh, and notice this uh, deliberate juxtaposition of this ideal nomadic self against this modern gray gloomy self that is in dismay. And then I felt that the landscape in the countryside so uh, beautiful, it's boundless and unbroken, yet the city landscape is uh, to me, and polluted, and then people are in disarray, and 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 then they. Uh, so I thought that there is this deliberate projection of the ideal self that's nomadic, past, and pristine, and then we have 
this modern society that is so plagued by the ills of modernity. And in fact, the opening scene starts with, again, this uninterrupted, beautiful Mongolian landscape. And we see rivers and we hear green hills. And then that's interrupted by this snaking train that going through this very gloomy winter landscape. So I thought it was deliberate, uh, uh, expression of penetration of modernity onto Mongolian uh, this nomadic um, so hey, can I just add so ask something uh-huh isn't that what's happening yes so that's what I was um, the second pro uh, issue that I had with the film not an issue issue this is my personal opinion so I think you've created successfully this ideal image of Mongolia which is nomadic self and then you created this um, contemporary world that is so plagued by alcoholism, homelessness, and pollution. And then you tell the stories through different people. And we have politicians telling the story. We have uh, public officials telling the story. We have artists telling the story. But in the film, throughout the film, I don't, unless I missed it, I didn't hear uh, herders, who I call herders, but in the films, uh, they're often appear as nomads. I don't think I've seen them talking in their own voice and then uh, in own, uh, they owning their own story and telling their version of what they see, right? So that was to me to portray, to represent, to uh, tell uh, the story, takes the agency away from this very people who we are trying to tell the story about. Bob, was the choice to go all English rather than uh, Mongolian interviews and subtitles? Um, is that sort of a technical choice, maybe even uh, just a financial or practical issue? Or, or how those, did that choice come? All of those. Uh, first uh -huh. of all, this is made for a Western audience, really. You know. The Mongols who have seen it, the Mongolians love it. But aside from that, uh, yeah, there, there are a lot of issues. We would have been working another two years on the film. Once you get into, tr we have translations like Men Do You, and there are others who speak, you know, Mongolian. But it, 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 we did the same thing in Burma, which, which is, and then we did the same thing in Angkor Awakening. So it's a kind of choice we have to make. Here's the problem. Uh, I don't know about Canadians, but Americans don't like to read subtitles, period. And besides not wanting to read, uh, <laughs> certainly 47% of the United States, right, are functionally illiterate. So that is a problem. If you want to get on major networks, if you want to, you know, get distribution, you can do a little bit, I, I'm not excusing it, and I, I, I kind of agree with her, but, uh, Orhan, but yeah, it, it is a conscious decision. Uh, it becomes very convoluted. then you need big crews, you need to have a, a translator talking in my ear, and then unless the translator knows the questions we want to ask, you're going through a chain. And I'm sure a Mongolian could do a much better film you know, uh, so, you know, no excuses are allowed. But basically, it, it just there were, there were economic decisions, there were audience decisions, there are commercial decisions, and maybe it's laziness, who knows? <laughs> well, it is on the part of viewers, one might say, right? <laughs> oh, Some yeah. subtitles really are a great joy. I'm, uh, I'm just in my um, political Scandinavian series kick. And so I've gone from Borgen to Occupied and I'm probably heading to Chapt and I'm watching them in Dan Danish, Norwegian and Icelandic. As a German speaker, I actually get something. It's great fun, right? I like the subtitles, but not yeah. all audiences do. Absolutely. No, no, I speak fluent Swedish. Uh, and uh, yeah, yeah I, I know the films and some of them are very good. Not all, but some of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I watch primarily foreign films, French films, Iranian films. Uh, the American films are all the same, right? There's always a couple running hand in hand and behind them a building is exploding, <laughs> you know, that, or cars are crashing, you know. 
Well, so that piece you avoided successfully with this film. No car crashes, no, no <laughs> romance. Well done. <laughs> oh, no, and, can I... and no sex, not even with animals. Very true, right? Ohan, can I follow up on something you started out with? Um, I mean, one of the, uh, the, what I like about your analysis is that, um, and as you know, my focus is sort of on, on politics and on mining to some extent, right? But we, we keep bumping into this self-construction of the nomadic self and of the enduring elements of nomadism. And we see a lot of this in Bob's film, right? But, um, but that's not Bob. That's that's people, that's like Oyungera tells that whole story. It's that whole narrative and, and it makes us cringe to some extent. It certainly makes me cringe because I say, look, come on, Genghis, give me a break. That's 800 years. And Herder, that's 100 years in your family. Yeah, maybe you ran around barefoot with your grandma, sure. But you are definitely a city person, right? And so um, while I sort of share that reaction, I do think that um, that the the discussions that that Bob selector or the people that he selected and the way they talk about this and they were a whole you know some of these people are quite sophisticated Mongolian thinkers and commentators but that's how they see some of these things right and so that's not Bob that's them really and that's well, they kind of see themselves still as warriors many of them right yeah and and you know Mongolians you know if you walk into a bar as a male uh, out, you know a, a American or North American male, and you step in the bar and you start chatting up a Mongolian girl, you can get beaten up. And I know many cases of this. So there is this, uh, yeah, this sense of no one's going to steal my women, and we're tough guys, right? There's a lot of this sort of macho um, sort of underpinning. And maybe I'm wrong. You can correct me. I, that's now, this, this, is, this is something that uh, one of my students actually uh, who wound up being a uh, the head of the Soros Foundation when it was founded in the late 90s, uh, was uh, dating a Mongolian woman. It's not the, the other way around, it's not so difficult. But uh, he was dating a Mongolian woman, they got into a taxi, taxi drove them to a place where he was really badly beaten up. Uh, th there is a, a, a kind of fear of uh, um, the race or whatever you want to call it, it's not a race, but uh, of being undercut in, in this way. And uh, he eventually married this woman, so it worked out very, very uh, well in the long run. But he really, uh, I happened to be there in Mongolia at the time, and uh, he was hospitalized. He was really in bad shape for a couple of weeks. So there is that element. It's not true, obviously. It's a limited group of people, but there is that fear that the Mongols will be uh, will disappear as a as a group. Another thing, uh, heard, whoops, another thing that I heard, and I heard this you know, more than once, that, that they they think that Hitler was a great man, and you can see on the back of some of the SUVs, you know, there is the Buddhist equivalent of the swastika, but you see the actual swastika on cars. And so that's something, I think they don't understand what they are doing or what they're portraying, but I've seen that also. So there's this, you know, nationalistic element, which we don't have in America or Germany or, right? <laughs> uh, you know, it's everywhere in the world. But I, I, I did see that, uh, it, it's this tough guy image and yeah, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm just observing it. I, yeah, I'm not uh, condemning it. It's just the reality. No, uh, I, I agree to, to some extent. And I think going back to your question that Julian posed earlier, uh, throughout the film, we do hear this story over and over again being retold by Mongolians that we are this land of nomads. But it comes with very different uh, set of... Um, feelings and emotions attached to this identity. And one of them is, like you said, this uh, uh, reverence of Chinggis Khan, and then also this very warrior-like warrior mentality and so on. But uh, I think it helps to escape from uh, issues that are faced in, uh, even today in Mongolia. So one of the key things that emerged from the film was how the 
Uh, Mongolia is very gender equal society, historically has been until uh, today is. Uh, what to me, it ignores this romantic, romantic view of this nostalgic past. What it overlooks is um, some of the key issues that are faced today, including and today, uh, women are uh, still fighting for equal representation in politics. And uh, they've been fighting for the last many years to have 32, up to 30% of the political representation, despite the fact that women are still uh, heavily more educated and qualified than their male partners. And actually related to that, the film, one of the things that I noticed early on in the film was that you were telling the story about how Mongolia is just so forward in gender representation. Again, was historically in, during the Chinese Han period and then since then, which is not to say that it's inaccurate completely, uh, but while you were telling the story, I couldn't help but notice that your film starts with commentators, you one, two, three, five, and 10. I still don't see any female commentator uh, emerging in this scene. So th I found that to be a little bit troublesome. And then uh, I think Ayungirut was the 12th person to uh, appear in the scene to provide her commentary. So it is complicated. I think it's very nuanced. It's um, Mongolians do play uh, this role of uh, perpetuating this idea of nomadic uh, ideal self, which is yeah, also perpetuated by the foreigners. Bob, the, uh, to some extent, I don't know, Morris and Ohan, if you describe yourself as area specialists or, or country specialists or so, but to some extent, one of the things we in that field as scholars struggle with, or one of our project is combating stereotypes, right? And compare, uh, combating simplistic portrayals. Um, you're limited by, you know, an idea of this is going to be roughly an hour and 15 minutes or so. There's only so much I can say. You appeal, you have to appeal to audiences because that's the only way you're able to make these kind of films. So that dictates things like, uh, like language or so. Um, but at the same time, the, you, you give us little snippets of conversations all along uh, and there's, there's lots of truth in all that, um, but you along the way surely also see where, where there's little bits where you say, well, you know, this, is this really true of the Mongolians or so, right? The sort of capital T, the Mongolians. Um, and, and you recognize that and you know that as a filmmaker who's looking specifically at these foreign, maybe as you said, we used to say exotic locales or so, how do you navigate that? Because you're aware of that, right? When, you, when, when people talk about all oh, Mongolians and punctuality or so, right? Some of that is, there's some truth to that obviously, oh, but some yes. of that is, is just stereotyping too, right? And, yeah. and, and we know some of the reasons that, that as academics, we try to sort of fight some of that is because we know where stereotyping can lead, right? And, and you know all this. So, so how do you walk that line in developing a narrative of, of wanting to appeal um, and, and, and teasing out some of these truths, but at the same time, not wanting to do, to, to do that branding and that exoticizing and that stereotyping, right? Yeah, well, let me just say one thing is that as a film director, uh, what you're seeing is what I'm letting you see. You're looking, in, and this is true of any film, you're looking through a keyhole. And if you think you're not in the documentary, if you think you're getting the broad view, you're fooling yourself, you, the, the viewer. So you're seeing, you know, I'm a novelist. I'm, I'm a storyteller. I am not an academic. By the way, every time I've showed films to academics, like the Burma film, I showed it at one of the big, Burma conferences, which I'll never do again. Uh, you get people who get just outraged. And I, I'll give you an example. I, look, I, I, mean, I suppose I qualify as an academic maybe too, but not in, in your fields. Uh, we had a, you know, we were doing an adoption of a textbook. And one of the guys, a German, by the way, whose name I won't mention, uh, found on page, you know, like 133 out of, you know, 1,000 pages, there 
the vector for gravity was pointing up instead of down. Get rid of, we cannot use this book. So it was like this, if you understand, academics, this is, I thought I'd just needle you guys a little bit. Academics tend to get caught on micro details, whereas I, I'm interested in the macro and I'm an entertainer. If I can get interest raised in Mongolia, and yeah, Jack, my agent, my literary agent read Weatherford's book and, you know, argued with it, you know, that, you know, he puts a sheen on, on Genghis Khan. Uh, I, I have no excuses whatsoever. So uh, if I don't, look, you could make your movie. By the way, I have always people say, oh, you forgot some X. Well, I, you know, I go to audiences, somebody in the back will say, you forgot, the, you know, the, the uh, indigenous people of the far Northeast. And I said, you're right, I forgot it. In the same sense that I didn't do mining. But I always tell people, but by the way, you know, when you, I want, you make your film, you can include those native people and I will come to see it. So make your own movie and uh, it's easy to make a movie. Actually, it's not, it's horrible uh, <laughs> because it's like being pregnant, you know, giving birth. If this is a pregnancy, it can last years. And women from who I've spoken with tell me that if they knew what be a pregnancy and birth, childbirth were like, they would never do it again, but they do it again. <laughs> So it's a state, you know, not to excuse anything. This is just, I'm trying to take you into a country and just give you a little bit of a taste. I'm hoping that it raises questions and you want to, you, the audience, want to read more and learn more about it. And yeah, we make mistakes like crazy and, and they're, you know, inaccuracies. I worry about the history. We did Baron von Unger. Yeah. I, I was arguing with our editors, you know, leave it alone. You know, the, if you look at the history of that period, it's terribly complicated. And so we had to, I don't know if we succeeded to try to boil it down. Again, you can go off on tangents and we got to keep the train moving. You know, that's, and I worry always about, I don't want to make an educational film. That is the kiss of death in this business. And it is a business, it's showbiz, really, you know? Um, so I hate to sound mercenary, but that, that is the reality. I, I've got to take you on a ride and I've got to you know, grab you by the collar and not let go till the bitter end. And if, I, if the energy flags or something, we're finished. So that's the reality of making movies. So I, I knew about the mining business. I, I, I'm unhappy with a country that relies on extractive industries. Um, Hello, I mean, Canada. <laughs> why is the Canadian dollar so low? Is it because of, I have actually, I'm holding a lot of Canadian dollars. I've spent a lot of time in British Columbia, by the way, I'm in Sydney. And why is the Canadian dollar so low? Is it because of extractive industries? Same thing happened to Mongolia. Is that true? In part, yeah. Morris, you've tried to walk this line. I mean, your, your Mongols and Global History, you published with Norton, and, yeah. and that's right, and it's rooted in your scholarship, obviously, but it's also trying to address broader and wider audiences. No, I've done uh, both scholarly books and books that are meant for a wider audience, for popular, and I believe those are very important. Uh, I believe popularization is vital. Uh, and I'm just coming out of, with a book actually on the Uyghurs uh, and China at the moment. Um, and, and that was what I found so endearing about your film, Bob, uh, that you uh, uh, got, particularly on the modern part, as I say, it, it uh, gave quite, it went beyond stereotypes and it, it gave us a vivid picture of what life is like in Mongolia at the moment. And it went beyond the stereotypes of these nomads out in the steppe lands, uh, enjoying life and uh, liberty and all this stuff. Um, uh, that was great. I, I, I thought that kind of popularization is wonderful uh, because it, it gives the viewer a feeling of what life is like in Mongolia at the moment. So I, uh, I found that uh, uh, really quite uh, on target. Um, I, one, of the German, one of the German reviewers uh, wrote that uh, this was the first film where it wasn't about mare's milk. You, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. You know, to echo what you're saying, that it wasn't just, you know, about 
yeah, I've seen a number of Mongolian films, and it is like, oh, life on the step is so, is so great. Yeah, it's great that you get a zud, right? <laughs> you're trying to, it's, uh, you know, this was the most exhausting film I've ever made. Um, uh, because when you travel, and you know all this, I'm not telling you anything, there are no roads to speak of, you know, in much of the country. I spent 10 hours from buying a movie going out. I came back after, the, you know, that shoot, and I got up the next morning and I couldn't get out of bed. I was convinced I had the flu and I had a lunch with the, my guide and I couldn't make it. And then I thought, oh, I'm dying here in Bayanogi, you know? And two hours later, I was back up and running, but it is exhausting. You know, I was sleeping in a tent, but another slow line and sleep, you know, sleeping in girls with families, not a lot of privacy with three generations, uh, you know, pooping on the step and, uh, <laughs> You know, that gets tiring. I, I would prefer the Intercontinental Hotel, for example. <laughs> or the Chinggis Khan Hotel. <laughs> a classic. Well, you know, to, to the many Mongols that one comes across have this, you know, image of themselves relating to the, the countryside. I think, Orhan, do, do you, do you uh, think that that's true? And, and they've really moved away from that in terms of their values, their ideas. They have this ideal image of, uh, you know, they're coming, they're coming from uh, that kind of background, but they're really urban folk. And I think that's what uh, Bob was so successful at getting at. Yeah, I think so. Um, so again, there is this really, to me anyway, um, very long uh, storyline um, that's telling I think through the voices of Westerners, through voices of Mongolians, that this ideal nomadic Mongolian self. So, and then what it does, it oversimplifies what I said earlier, this really complex Mongolian human terrain. To me, teachers and uh, artists and politicians, nurses are just as Mongolians as herders, right? So I grew up in a small town in Mongolia. I was not a herder, I was not a nomad, but Mongolians do have this incredible attachment to the idea of nomadism. And then we continually re uh, recreate this image of ideal nomadic self when in fact, Again, the lesser, lesser number of people are practicing um, pastoral nomadism. Even then, the number of people who routinely migrate are very low. So majority of the Mongolians are now settled in urban places, but they do have the strong emotional attachment to the idea of Mongolia is this land of nomads. So yeah, I saw that in, in the voices of a young girl and, it, and the artist who uh, I felt uh, uh, kind of sad. Uh, and then also I could see his deep emotion and pain and agony in that painting where he had this uh, vodka bottles named Nomad, right? And then he he's crying for what's in his mind lost and being lost. And then we are chipping away from our nomadic, this ideal self, and then we are, so I'm not, I'm not saying, Bob, you are recreating this exoticization of Mongolia. We routinely engage in this performative aspect of identity making ourselves. Yeah. I think the, uh, uh, when I teach uh, my course on Mongolian history, the, the, the students always come in with this vision of Genghis Khan and warfare and so on. And uh, you've got to, <laughs> uh, make a point. I, I think by having Manduyo uh, there, a poet, uh, you uh, brought in something beyond warfare and beyond Genghis Khan and, and so on that, uh, that, that will prove to be illuminating to students. They, their, their whole image of the Mongols is conquest and uh, military matters, and you try to uh, point out to them that the, the Mongols were very important in cultural uh, transmission, uh, artistic transmission, and, and so on, and uh, that shakes them up a bit. Um, and I think your the, the urban aspect of your, your film will also shake them up. I think the, the uh, you know the the aspect of, of using a poet uh, so prominently 
in the film was, was great. I thought, I thought that was very, very sensible and it shakes up some of the myths that we have about the, about the Mongols. You know, there's an analogy, uh, there's an analogy to UB in Sweden. And the Swedes until recently, I say that in a very broad sense, were farmers living on the land and they're country people. And now, you know, they've moved to Stockholm and Malmö and the other big cities. But as soon as they have a vacation, any slight excuse, they are out in the countryside. And that's what they identify with. They're skiing or they're, you know, they have their stugas or their dachas equivalent. And they're in the archipelagos. It's same thing. It really is you know, uh, I think people in general, myself included, I grew up in New York City and I wanted a, a lawn. I always wanted a grass lawn. I got 120 acres of grass now. <laughs> but it's the same thing, uh, this longing to be in touch with nature, which is, a, I think, a very healthy thing. It grounds people. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I like the idea that they, uh, you know, I had a bunch of students. I was teaching at the film school and we went out, you know, onto the step and they were just having a ball, they, I mean, they've become different human beings. They're so happy. Uh, I, and I, I've seen this in other cultures and, uh, and I admire it. And I think that, you know, people living in, you're in Manhattan, you know, I grew up in Queens. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, when I'm in New York and I'm there until recently, <laughs> regularly, you know, one week in like, well, first of all, I'm in Central Park as soon as I can get there. And then one week, I got to get out into the country. So th this is what I felt also in Mongolia with the Mongolians. And, you know, just my view, again, it's a keyhole view. I don't know, you know, it didn't do a broad sampling. Well, uh, our park is Riverside Park, so which is right, we're right on top of it. We're, <laughs> we're a block away from Riverside. So we have that natural experience and, and uh, every morning, uh, even during the pandemic, we've, we've been walking in Riverside Park for an hour every morning. Uh, and that's kept us sane. I agree with you on that score. Uh, what, what interests me, what I was thinking about uh, in, in this discussion, uh, I find extraordinarily enough that the uh, uh, so, sort of number of students who take Mongolian history as opposed to Chinese is remarkable. Why? I almost double the number of students in Mongolian history that I do in Chinese history. Six Why? I don't know. I, uh, a part of it, maybe, I, I don't think I teach differently. Uh, I, uh, I don't think my assignments are any different uh, in the two places. But I think people are uh, partly the exotic quality. That's something that uh, you, Julian mentioned uh, originally. Uh, partly because they don't, some of the students are very sophisticated. Some of them been to China, uh, and uh, they're, well, they're <laughs> Mongolia is out of their can. It's a different ball game altogether. Uh, I think the the interest in anthropology, that kind of uh, interest, uh, provokes that. The interest in Tibetan Buddhism, but uh, but it is striking. The large the, the difference is 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 remarkable. What, do you find that, Orhan? Do you, uh, in, in, well, I, I don't know if you teach Chinese history. No, no I haven't. Well, uh, so back to uh, Julian's question. I'm not an area specialist. I did, uh, I've written several articles on Mongolia in my book, but I do generally uh, political geography of mobility and displacement. So I've been working with refugees in Tucson. That has been my central focus. But again, going back to Julian's another question about the stereotypes and then my goal is in any way to give a little more nuanced version of Mongolia if I can than this oversimplified, exoticized, romanticized version of Mongolia. Yeah, great. Morris, is that recent or do you see that over a couple decades, the interest in uh, Mongolian history? I've seen it maybe over the past 10 years. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, my course in Mongolia's history is always filled, overfilled, and we've gotten to the point. Uh, I used to have a TA to help out. At one point, I had uh, over 100 students in the Mongol course. Uh, it, uh, I've cut it back because I just can't uh, do 350 papers a, a semester. <laughs> uh, 
and there is a limit, but kids, they don't uh, try to get into the Chinese history course as much as they do to try to get to the Mongol history. I get emails uh, when they're registering, this is all booked up and so on. Uh, I don't get that in the Chinese history, but the Mongol history I do. Bob, sounds like you have an audience in, uh, in Manhattan. All of, yeah. all of the yeah. students are, are eagerly waiting. Yes. So tell us, what's, what's the next project? Uh, you're probably working on it already, uh, and you don't have to let the, the, the proverbial cat out of the bag, but you can hint if you like. Well, I'm thinking of two things. One is I'd like to go back to fiction films and doing a musical. Maybe I can do a musical in Mongolia. Well, the talent's there, as you showed in the film, right? Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, 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 Mongolians are incredibly musical, phenomenal. And I, it was a discovery. I didn't go in, by the way, with any preconceived ideas. And by chance, uh, this woman, Badi, who's a ballet mistress, lured me into the, you know, the opera and ballet. It's world class. It is just phenomenal. And then, of course, the, the long song. I, you know, the music is, is kind of, you know, here I'm tooting my own horn, but it isn't my horn. It's our, it's our editor's horn. Uh, the musical track, the track is rich, very, very rich in music, I thought. Uh, the next project is, so maybe I, I'm really very interested in music. I took the piano up in the last three years after dropping it for a hundred. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, do you know about the MacArthur Genius Award? Right, you know what that is, right? Well. I'm furious that I haven't gotten the McDonald, uh, the MacArthur Genius Award. And I've decided, it's a secret committee, and I've decided to A, interview those people who've gotten it in various fields and find out where the secret committee is because I'm going to confront them because I want my MacArthur. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the truth is they don't give it to older people, they give it for young promising people. And, but I think it's, it could be the conceit, it, you know, it could be a lot of fun. Um, so, I, and uh, I posted once on my Facebook page that I had been shortlisted for the Nobel Prize for General Excellence. And people were like, no kidding, you know, it was like, really, you know? <laughs> I think you have a better claim there than some other people who talk about their nominations for the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, <laughs> you mean Henry Kissinger? Oh yeah, absolutely. That's who I was thinking of right now. <laughs> uh, audience members, you've been very patient. We've got just a couple moments left. Is there a burning question uh, from having watched the film that you want to ask our filmmaker? Ivan, you're the only one who dares keep his picture on, but and you've been listening attentively. Um, did you want to comment or ask a question? I don't have a comment because I've only watched the trailer, not the full film. Uh, but I was very interested in some of the uh, comments that came out for from each of you uh, related to uh, uh, culture and why um, perhaps more people are interested in uh, Mongolia than China and, and the uh, contrast between the rural and urban. Uh, I, I find it fascinating from my own perspective and, and uh, another time, there's no time now, but I'd, I'd love to discuss that. Fantastic. Can I, yeah. Can I give you all my email in case you don't have it? And yeah. that's the way, if you do want to show your students or whatever. So my, you have, do you have a pencil? It's very simple. It's my initials, RHL, Robert H. Lieberman, RHL, number 10. So RHL10 at Cornell, and you all know it has double L, <laughs> dot, dot edu, and I'm sure you've seen the edu elsewhere. Uh, so yeah. I, by the way, thank you for having me. It's been delightful. Uh, you have Actually, Bob, Bob, Bob my, my daughter went to Cornell and had a wonderful experience there. My uh, sons uh, both went to Cornell. My granddaughter's going to Cornell. My brother-in-law was a dean <laughs> here. It's you know, Cornell to the eighth power and is very incestuous. Uh, anyhow, thank you so much for not thank telling you. me to pieces. And uh, <laughs> I, it's been a delight and I hope we can all meet somewhere somehow. Um, we, I'd love to show the film in British Columbia, you know, be, and uh, of course, New York and, and you know, Toronto and uh, around the world. I don't know where people are located, you know, can I ask that question? Okay. I'm in British Columbia. Okay. A couple more names I see who are in Vancouver. Uh, one Ottawa name. 
Um, and a couple, I don't know. Uh, probably North America, though. By the way, if Trump gets reelected... You're uh, welcome. Come on over. Put the words <laughs> out, except that the Canadians are building a wall and charging, well, we'd have to. <laughs> and charging the Americans. Who's paying for it? <laughs> the Americans. And, you know, you, of course. <laughs> maybe it'll push the dollar up and we'll do better, the Canadian dollar, that is. Did you catch the one line in the film? Oh, we cut one of the lines about the Great Wall of China. And the guy, we cut this line, and he said, well, it looks like walls just don't work. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that keeps going around on Twitter as well. Pictures of the, the Great Wall and comparisons, absolutely. Bob, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Morris, Orhan, thank you so much for, uh, for coming uh, and discussing. Uh, I think, Bob, you could tell that we've, uh, it's all been, we really enjoyed the movie. Um, and we do have our pe peculiar academic views, um, but, we, but we really appreciate the, the, the attempt and the, the push <coughs> to introduce a different and wider audience to the Mongolia that we find fascinating, uh, often love, um, sometimes get annoyed with, uh, but continue to be fascinated. So uh, I think you've, you've done us as a field, you've done us a great service and, and we're thankful for that. Um, and um, hope that the, the film reaches a, a wider audience um, and congratulate you on the, on the completion and then look forward to learn about other places in the future, including that musical uh, with hopefully <laughs> some, some Mongolian uh, opera in it uh, or whatever you can fit in there. Thank, Thank you everyone for joining us today uh, and please enjoy your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.